Hello and welcome to the series of lectures which will give you an introduction to the topic of pharmacokinetics. My name is Leon Ahrens and I'm in Manchester at the University of Manchester, Manchester Pharmacy School. So what we hope to cover in this initial lecture is to list the various applications of pharmacokinetics, define the terms absorption, disposition, distribution, elimination, excretion and metabolism, and give you a very basic introduction to the sort of models that you're going to come across later, which are used to characterize the kinetics of absorption and disposition. And if time permits, we will describe the role of pharmacokinetics in drug development. So this particular scenario shown in figure one gives us a good idea of why we're interested in pharmacokinetics. And it's really about variability. So you probably know that if you were to give the same dose of a particular drug to a panel of subjects, they will all have different responses. Some of that response will be due to the fact that they have different receptor activities, and therefore, which may be down to genetic reasons, but also some of that variability will be down to the fact that the way they actually handle the drug, the way the drug is absorbed, distributed, and eliminated from the body varies from subject to subject. So basically, pharmacokinetics, if you look at this diagram, looks at the relationship between the dosage regimen that you administer and the achieved plasma concentration. Whereas the related topic of pharmacodynamics looks at the relationship between the concentration of drug and the pharmacological effect, which may well be the clinical outcome or it may be some biomarker. Now, you may notice in this middle box here, what we would really like to be able to do is to uh, measure the drug at the receptor site, that is at its site of action. But of course, that's generally not accessible. And what we do is we use the plasma concentration as a surrogate. So pharmacokinetics is essentially the relationship between the dosage regimen and the plasma concentration. And pharmacodynamics is the relationship between the plasma concentration and the response. Where the major source of variability is will vary from drug to drug. If uh, the major source of variability is pharmacokinetic, then by measuring the plasma concentration, we can account for a large amount of the variability between the dose we administer and the effect we see. On the other hand, if most of the variability is in, in the uh, pharmacology, in the pharmacodynamics, then the plasma concentration will not be such a good predictor of the outcome. At the bottom here, you'll see a couple of definitions which are used wide, widely. You'll see them used that pharmacokinetics is how the body handles the drug. In other words, how it, the drug is absorbed, distributed, and eliminated from the body. Whereas pharmacodynamics is basically what the drug, what effect the drug actually has on the body. So what is shown on the in figure two here then basically describes the pharmacokinetic processes which i'll say a little bit about um, the drug has to get into the body of course it could be injected directly into the bloodstreams as such as an intravenous uh, in bolus injection more commonly drugs are given orally or they could be given intramuscularly or transdermally but the drug then has to be absorbed it has to cross a barrier so if you take the drug orally then the drug has to cross the gut wall and to get into the body the first tissue if you like that the drug gets into is the bloodstream but it's very rare that the site of action of a drug is in the blood there are there are somewhere that is the case but in general the site of action of the drug is not in blood but it's actually in some tissue normally inside some cell where the receptors reside so the drug has to get from the blood to the site of action and that's under the control of the distribution process that is the distribution of the drug out of the blood into these various tissues and finally of course the eventual fate of the drug is to be eliminated from the body and uh, there are various ways in which the drug can be eliminated and we'll talk about mainly two of these metabolism which is the chemical conversion of the drug into a metabolite and excretion where we have the removal of unchanged drug and as we'll see in the next slide metabolism mainly occurs in the liver and excretion mainly occurs via the kidney sometimes you'll see these processes of distribution elimination lumped together 
and spoken about is the disposition of the drug. But I don't think that particular title adds too much to our understanding. So these are the processes, ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. One important point to note, and I've already may, may alluded to this, is that everything we do in terms of trying to describe the pharmacokinetics of a drug is related to where we can measure it. And we are restricted. In other words, we can't measure, I've already mentioned, the drug usually at its site of action, which may be within a cell in a tissue. We are restricted to measuring the drug usually in the blood or sometimes in plasma, depending on where the assay is performed. Uh, we may be able to measure the metabolites of the drug, also in blood and plasma. And we also may see the end product, that is the drug excreted into urine, and indeed the metabolites excreted in the urine. So we are restricted in what we measure. And of course that therefore restricts uh, the amount of information we have and therefore the interpretation of these pharmacokinetic processes. So everything we do is based on measurements in plasma or blood or perhaps in urine. So these are the processes which I've just been describing. Absorption is basically getting the drug into the body. We'll talk about that in a later lecture. And one of the important uh, parameters we will come across here is called the bioavailability. And this is essentially to do with the extent of absorption, how much of the dose is absorbed. You're probably well aware that if you give a drug orally, you're not guaranteed that all of the dose will actually appear in the body. And so the fraction of the dose which you miss, it gets in the body is called the bioavailability. And then we have this distribution process, which I mentioned the drug normally has to get to its site of action, but also to other tissues throughout the body as well. And this is a reversible transfer of our substance between uh, the site of measurement, which is generally the blood, and other sites within the body. Metabolism then um, is basically the conversion, the normally irreversible conversion of the drug into another chemical species, which is the metabolite. And that was, we'll come on in a minute and we'll see that mainly occurs in the liver. Excretion, on the other hand, is also the irreversible loss of the drug, but this time it doesn't get converted to a metabolite first, it's excreted as unchanged drug. So the difference between metabolism and excretion, that in metabolism, the drug is converted to another chemical species, which may still be in the body, of course, and then may well be eliminated further via the, the metabolites themselves, whereas excretion then is the loss of unchanged drug. And we would lump metabolism excretion together as elimination. As already mentioned, sometimes you'll see the, the uh, term disposition used to actually include elimination and distribution processes. So this picture here, uh, figure three, is a picture of the body. So it's not complete. It's not a complete anatomical picture of the body, but it has a number of the major uh, tissues and organs that we're going to be interested in. So each of these little boxes you see here, and some are labeled, represents a tissue. And you'll see at the top the lung, and then you'll see the heart, you'll down see the kidney down here, the liver, and then the gut. So we haven't mentioned all the tissues, and we've lumped them all together and just call them other tissues. So here we might have muscle, bone, um, brain is not mentioned here, and so on. Um, so these may, these are important tissues in terms of the distribution of the drug, or indeed there may be off-target effects of the drug. But uh, for the purposes of pharmacokinetics, we're more interested in the labeled tissues here. Also, these arrows which are connecting these uh, boxes, these tissues, these are blood flows. And so if you go up to the heart-lung system, what happens here is the, uh, the heart pumps uh, drug directly into the lung where it's oxygenated, and then that is the arterial blood, which then circulates around the various tissues of the body, passes through these tissues, returns to the heart-lung system in the venous supply. So we have these two blood supplies, if you like, the arterial blood taking the drug to the tissues and the venous return, which returns the drug around the body. So it's a circulating system. In terms of the elimination, then we see, and I've already mentioned this, is the major site of drug metabolism is the liver, and the major site of drug excretion is the kidneys. 
Uh, we've also uh, included the gut in this diagram, and this is a, this is the major site of drug absorption for drugs given orally, of course. Uh, if drugs are not completely absorbed, of course, they may well pass down the gut and eventually appear in the feces. So uh, this is a physiological description of the pharmacokinetics and fate of a drug. So briefly, some of the applications of pharmacokinetics. And the name suggests pharmaco is Greek mainly for drug, and kinetics means essentially change with time. That's not exact definitions, Greek definitions, but that's what we mean by it. And so um, what pharmacokinetics does for us, it relates the temporal pattern of response to the drug administration. I already mentioned this previously, that we relate the uh, dosage regimen of a drug to uh, some sort of outcome. So uh, that may be uh, the design outcome, we call it the efficacy, or it may well be some sort of side effects, which we would call the toxicity. The second point here is that pharmacokinetics gives us a rational basis for drug design and drug selection, and very importantly, and we'll do a lot more of this later, dosage regimen design. By rational means, it gives us a scientific basis. So uh, we can say play with the chemical structure of a drug to ha make it have more favorable properties and then be selected to go through the drug development process. And of course, pharmacokinetics plays a very important part, as I already mentioned, in designing dosage regimens. In other words, what dose to use of a particular drug and how frequently do you give it. Uh, it's used uh, quite a lot in drug development and beyond to try to actually uh, evaluate the performance of the drug. And I've already mentioned the, uh, the term bioavailability, and this becomes very important for oral products and um, in the area of, gene of uh, generic uh, drug development where drugs have come off patents, then we have to improve the equivalence between the generic product and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the innovator's product, the original drug. And this is, can be done using pharmacokinetics, and we can couple that with some um, pharmaceutical tools such as in vitro dissolutions. And although we won't say a lot about it, the fourth point there is it uh, provides us a mean of, means of comparing data of the pharmacokinetics of a drug between different animal species. And this is important in drug development uh, because all the early work for safety reasons, of course, is done in animal species. And then you eventually need to scale that up to humans. And so being able to predict the pharmacokinetics in humans from animal studies is a very important application of pharmacokinetics. So, the pharmacokinetics of a drug, as it says here, is a function of obviously the properties of the drug, that's the physical chemical properties, we'll talk about pKa and lipophilicity, and obviously the structural properties of the drug. Uh, it depends on the dosage form, so are we giving an IV injection, uh, or are we giving an oral dose, and this of course is the next point as well, what route of administration are we going to use? And also, of course, the interaction between the dosage form and the body. So the physiology of the body plays a, a role here. And the bottom line there, number two, is that poor pharmacokinetic properties of drug may limit its clinical application. So a trivial example of that is if the uh, drug is not absorbed, if you give it orally, of course, it won't get into the body and exert its effect. So poor absorption is a property which you would like to try to avoid. And therefore, by maybe altering the properties of the drug, try, try, uh, having different derivatives, different structural derivatives, you may be able to improve on that. In terms of uh, variability, I've already mentioned what affects variability of a drug. And there's a number of factors listed here, which we'll talk about later. Um, go to the second of the in the list there. Size, so body size is an important determinant. Age is a determinant, so the neonate um, is very different to a mature individual. In the neonate, not all the organ functions such as kidney function, liver function have fully developed at birth, and therefore that will change over the first year or two years of life. And at the other end, of course, when people get very old, then some of the physiology starts to decline, and again, that affects the handling of drugs. The actual disease state being treated may affect 
the drug it's the drugs kinetics we will talk specifically about renal disease in a later lecture uh, for drugs which are excreted via the urinary route then a person who has poor renal function of course will not uh, be able to eliminate the drug and that will have an effect on uh, the concentration profile. In fact, you'll see higher concentrations in those individuals and that may lead to some problems if the drug uh, produces any sort of side effects. Um, the fact these days is uh, a patient in hospital receives many drugs and there's the potential for drugs to interact with each other. So drug-drug interactions is an important area where we can use pharmacokinetics. Environmental factors, uh, people who smoke tend to have different kinetics on some drugs than people who don't and so on. But the big one, the one I left out at the beginning is genetics. For genetics, we could almost uh, say uh, we don't know what the cause of the variability is. We believe it is genetic in origin, but it hasn't been discovered what the uh, genetic variants are between individuals. So in terms of trying to describe the pharmacokinetics of a drug, particularly in a quantitative sense, what do we need? We clearly need some data to get started. And we already mentioned that data tends to be plasma or blood concentrations. And also uh, we can measure drug in urine. And also uh, we could also mention uh, metabolites here. We may be able to get information on metabolites. But in order to understand that data, and that's going to be one of the primary purposes of this course and moving on later to when we start to talk about modeling, is that we have to use models of the pharmacokinetics of a drug to try to interpret the data and understand basically the behavior of the drug in the body. And eventually, of course, not only do we want to interpret the pharmacokinetics of the drug, we would like to be able to understand the drug action, that is the pharmacology, and so we need to be able to relate the pharmacokinetics, specifically the plasma or blood concentration, to the pharmacological outcome, and that is an area we mentioned of pharmacodynamics. So one uh, of these models which I've briefly mentioned um, sometimes you can get away, uh, particularly if you are doing a descriptive study of a drug and you're doing a clinical trial, particularly by equivalent studies, with using just summary parameters of the drug in the body. So for you see here the maximum concentration and the time when that's achieved, something not mentioned there, which we'll use a lot later, is the area under the curve. So these are descriptive measurements and they, they, they don't require any modeling and they normally can just be derived directly from the data without too much effort. However, uh, by modeling the data, we can, do, we can do an awful lot more. And some of the reasons you'd like to, to use a model are just listed here. One may be simply as a summary of the data. So the model simply describes uh, the data, so in a very concise form. Uh, it allows you to do interpolation. Now, what does interpolation mean? Interpolation means that you want to predict the, let's say, the concentration time profile of a drug following a particular dosage regimen, but you will predict it over a range for which the model was already developed. So, in other words, you will use similar doses in similar subjects. So, you're not extending it beyond the range in which the model was actually developed. So, that's where that's uh, going to be fairly safe because you know the model works over that range. Uh, but sometimes you want to go beyond the range in which the model was developed, and that's what we call extrapolation. So an example of that would be you might have developed uh, the kinetics of the drug and a model for those kinetics in, say, a normal human volunteer population, say, for example, a phase one clinical trial, but you really want to actually predict what would happen in patients and uh, patients who have different pathologies, I already mentioned patients who might have renal impairment. And so basically you're extrapolating beyond on the uh, situation the model was developed and to do that you need some mechanistic aspects in the model so you want to be able to predict and finally uh, one model is very good at uh, helps us with at least is to facilitate understanding of the kinetics so it's the parameters of the model which become an issue here and we'll talk about these parameters the ones that describing absorption distribution elimination later so uh, by actually uh, developing the model and determining these parameters from data, then we can actually understand uh, how the drug uh, behaves and how it works in the body. And as it says, 
the more mechanistic the model is, that is more features that it has in terms of the structure of the drug, in terms of the physiology of the body, then they are greater the ability to make predictions and extrapolations, as I've already mentioned. All right, so let's have a look at some models, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this will be the subject of later lectures, but just to give you a quick introduction. So a model is basically a mathematical expression which describes the data. So if you look at uh, number one there, we see a model which is quite often used uh, with the sort of data that we see. And as I say, I'm not going to describe this in detail, but that's an exponential model. You see E, the exponential number there, E to the minus B, T, T is time, C is concentration. Now, uh, this is just an equation. It's just a mathematical expression. I could have used anything here. I could have used a straight line. I could have used a quadratic. I could have used a number of things. And if all I was interested in doing was describing the data, that would be fine. There is a reason we use these exponentials because most of our data seems to actually have this exponential behavior. But they are still relatively, we describe as empirical. In other words, they are simply descriptions of the, uh, the data. As we get more involved in trying to understand our drug, and we already mentioned this, that uh, we need to um, have a more mechanistic model, then we start to build what are known as physiological models. And these include the physiology of the body. So that little uh, figure there, figure four, gives you an idea of that sort of model in which we actually look at particular organs of the body. This might be the liver, for example. And what you see is that the drug is delivered to that organ by the arterial blood supply. And it returns around the body in the venous blood supply. And if it is an eliminating organ, I mentioned it could be the liver, for example, then elimination may occur there. So we build the model around that physiology. And that's what we mean by having a more mechanistic model. Uh, in terms of the workhorse of our kinetic models, these are mainly what are called compartmental models. And I'm going to show you a couple of these in the next slide. So I'm going to, I'll show you two of these. The one on the left, figure five, then, is a, what's called a one compartment model. Now, in this model, uh, which may seem very unrealistic if you've not come across it before, we consider the body to be essentially like a well-stirred beaker. So the drug, once it enters the body by whatever input means it enters the body, immediately distributes uh, uniformly throughout the whole body. That happens instantaneously. Now, of course, we know that doesn't happen. We know that's unrealistic. But in fact, this uh, somewhat unrealistic model actually works for many clinical pharmacokinetic cases. In other words, you can use this in clinics for dosing people. So even though it's not that realistic, it actually works for many drugs. And basically, we will use this model extensively throughout this introductory course, and we'll only make it more complicated when necessary. So this is going to be our workhorse. So we have this one compartment where the drug is in the body. The drug has to get into the body, of course, and you see on the left-hand side there, we might have absorption of the drug into the body, or we could have the drug directly injected into the body. And of course, we have eventually elimination from the body. So you see on the right-hand side, we have elimination. As I said, surprisingly, that uh, model works quite well for many drugs in clinical practice, but of course, not for all. And sometimes you do have to make the model a bit more realistically. And if you have a look at the second uh, model there, figure six, what we have is what's called a two-compartment model. Now what we acknowledge is that the distribution process that we had in uh, the one compartment model is not instantaneous, it takes time. So we say here that the drug enters the so-called central compartment, which will include the bloodstream, and distributes in that compartment, as we have with the one compartment model, very quickly. But then it takes time for the drug to distribute out into uh, more peripheral tissues, and we have this peripheral compartment. In fact, you could expand this model to have many compartments, and what are known as physiologically based pharmacokinetic models actually has many, many compartments, maybe up to 15 compartments, where each of these compartments now represents real tissues. But uh, for, again, for a lot of data, you don't need to go beyond this two-compartment model. 
Now, the important thing to note with both these models, more particularly with the, with the one compartment model, is that these so-called compartments don't represent real physiologic spaces. So in many ways, these are similar to the empirical exponential models, which I described on the previous slide. They are just representations, they are mathematical representations of what goes on. In other words, they describe the concentration time profile. So be, be very careful about that. These compartments do not represent real physiological spaces. Uh, these more sophisticated models I just briefly mentioned earlier, these uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models, they, in those cases, then we start to build a model in which the compartments are real physical, physiological spaces. But we will not uh, deal with those models in this course. That, that's beyond the scope of this course. So let us now see what the profile in the body looks like. And that's shown in figure eight. And it's based on the rate equation, which we had in the previous slide, equation two. So on the y-axis, we have basically the amount of drug in the body, and it's expressed as a percentage of the dose. So 100 represents 100% 100 of the dose. And then along the x-axis, we have time. So initially looking at the amount of drug at the absorption site, for example, in the gut, what we see is that that decreases as the drug is absorbed into the body. Then if we look at uh, the amount of drug in the body then, we see as it gets absorbed, it increases. But then it goes through a maximum. And remember, we used this parameter earlier when we were describing descriptive uh, description of the, um, the pharmacokinetics of the drug. So the maximum amount of drug in the body and when it occurs is a description of the kinetics. But of course, uh, as the drug uh, reaches this maximum, then of course at the same time it's being eliminated. And so what you then see is the decline of the level in the drug in the body as it's eliminated. And what you'll see here is the buildup of the metabolites, presumably excreted in the urine, and then also uh, of the excreted unchanged drug again in the urine. So in the lectures to come, what we're going to do is describe the factors, and they're going to be the pharmacokinetic parameters and physiological factors, which affects these shapes. And then beyond that, we're going to turn this around and look at how we actually estimate or even predict these profiles based on real data. So given data, then how do we actually estimate the parameters which give rise to these profiles? So finally, just a few words about the place of pharmacokinetics in drug development. And um, it's fair to say that pharmacokinetics is used throughout the whole drug development process. And here we have a schematic representation of that drug development process shown in figure nine. So it starts off with animal testing, and a lot of that animal testing has to do with safety, of course. Pharmacokinetics uh, helps us understand the relationship between the drug and any potential toxicity. So a very naive uh, example of that would be if you can't show the drug is absorbed in the body, the fact that you don't see toxicity doesn't mean the drug is not toxic. It just means it never got in. So understanding the pharmacokinetics in the animal is important to interpret the animal uh, data. Also, uh, the animal data is used to try to predict the first dose in man. So uh, we try to scale from the animal species up to man, and that is a pharmacokinetic modeling exercise, which we'll, we'll talk very briefly about later in the course. Once you get into man, of course, then there are a whole range of uh, clinical studies. They tend to be divided into phases. Phase one, uh, quite often, is in just in normal volunteers. This is the first administration of the drug to humans. And we can gather pharmacokinetic information on the drug at this stage. Eventually, then moving to phase two, which are the first patient studies. And of course, what we're interested in here is whether the drug actually produces a pharmacological effect. And we want to look at the relationship between the plasma concentration and the pharmacological effect. So that's PKPD right there. 
and understanding that will allow us to set the doses for the next range of clinical trials, which are these phase three trials, in which uh, large groups of patients are administered drug and they are monitored for both safety and efficacy. And PKPD helps us understand that data. And as you see, also you can do studies in special populations. And we'll talk about those patients who have some degree of renal impairment. Um, this data then is um, supplied to a regulatory authority, which if they are happy with the, uh, the package of information, uh, will give a license to the company to market the drug. And beyond, uh, that uh, license, of course, the drug goes out into clinical use. And then uh, people will continue to study the properties of the drug and again, including the pharmacokinetics of the drug. So as I said, pharmacokinetics plays a role throughout the whole drug development process and is quite key to understanding a lot of the information which is actually developed within that process. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction. And uh, so in the next lectures in this series, we're going to talk about uh, pharmacokinetics um, of the drug. And we're going to talk about the processes to begin with, absorption, distribution, and elimination in detail. And then we'll move on to the quantitative aspects, how these parameters give rise to those profiles I was talking about in the previous slide. So uh, hopefully you can join me for the next lecture.